Well, as Lynn said, this is the first time that uh, there will be a Department of Defense payload uh, on board the shuttle, and Jules Bergman has prepared this report on just what uh, is in this mission for the Pentagon and what they hope to accomplish. It's all a big secret, but uh, naturally, word has gotten out. It is called Cirrus for cryogenic infrared radiance instrumentation for shuttle. Although it's mounted in the huge shuttle payload bay, you will never see it or hear it referred to during the flight of the Columbia or for that matter afterward. Cirrus is aimed at the Earth through the open payload bay doors. It will provide the data so that future early warning spacecraft will be able to pick out the heat of a missile's exhaust during its launch phase and warn us in time to counterattack. The second part of the Cirrus package is a series of ultraviolet sensors that can see the curved edge of the Earth and pick out missiles as they rise above it against the black void of space to deliver yet another warning. Cirrus is the test bed of a new generation of warning satellites leading us into a new era using manned space for military purposes. Several years from now, the shuttle would carry laser battle stations into orbit so that they could destroy Soviet missiles after warning from the infrared satellites before the missiles ever reach space. With the shuttle, the U.S. is learning to use space as a new military medium. Yesterday's science fiction is becoming tomorrow's science fact today. Well, let's hope it never really becomes fact, Jules, but uh, I guess it's uh, important to uh, go ahead with all the latest gimmicks. The uh, military payload was put on board the shuttle in the huge vehicle assembly building, and we are zooming in now to the front of that, where uh, the launch control uh, building is located. And Jules Bergman, who has watched every manned launch from the United States of America, is in the firing room right now. Jules, don't touch any buttons. Frank, I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> Shortly, uh, of course, we're going to, uh, at T-minus nine minutes, when the whole... When the count picks up, uh, the GLS, the ground launch sequ sequencer, the computer takes over. So there are no buttons anyone can touch uh, short of stopping it. But we wouldn't dream of touching any buttons anyway. Be a great temptation. Jules, have you heard the rumor that, uh, naturally, since I'm in Washington, we hear rumors quite frequently here, that there really isn't any Defense Department payload on board this thing, that there's just an empty box. Frank, and all they're trying to do is uh, just test the secrecy. Frank, I can guarantee you that there is a Defense Department payload aboard. I can't tell you my sources, but I can tell you flatly that there is a payload aboard that both measures infrared frequencies and ultraviolet frequencies. Okay, Jules, thank you very much. Well, You're we welcome, have about uh, three and a half minutes left in the uh, ten-minute hold. The clock, as you see, is stopped at nine minutes, and when it starts, we'll have nine minutes to go before liftoff. So... We'll continue with our coverage of the Space Shuttle Columbia after this commercial and a word from our local stations. Columbia, the Space Shuttle, is on the pad there at Cape Kennedy, at uh, Cape Canaveral, I should say, at the Kennedy Space Center. And the clock is uh, still stopped with uh, nine minutes to go. Gene Cernan, uh, everything seems to be going very well, but of course we all remember past uh, occasions when we got right down to the 30-second mark. As a matter of fact, you got down to about that point on your mission, didn't you, when all of a sudden there was a delay? Frank, it, uh, as I sit here in a booth knowing uh, you're in Washington and, uh, and Lynn is in, uh, in Houston, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, suffering the emotional strain of this launch, but I love it. Uh, yes? All right, we're about to get a message now from Launch Control. Here we go. Launch Control, T-minus nine minutes and uh, holding. We have about 56 seconds remaining before coming out of the hold at the T-minus nine minute point. Uh, we have had a go on the fuel cell and are presently getting goes from the various managers monitoring uh, this morning's launch. Uh, Al O'Hara, the launch director, has wished the crew a successful liftoff and mission and says that we will see them in California on the an our country's 206th anniversary. Center Director Dick Smith wished them a good trip and said Godspeed and a War Eagle. The War Eagle being the uh, battle cry of the Auburn University teams, of which both uh, of our uh, astronauts on this morning's flight are alumnus, as well as Center Director Dick Smith. Coming out of our built-in hold, T minus nine minutes and counting. The launch... 
All right, they are counting. You see the clock is going now at eight minutes and 50 seconds to go. It is interesting to note that uh, this is probably the first time that uh, two astronauts have gone into space together, both alumni of the same institution, Auburn in uh, Alabama. Tom Mattingly has been in space before. He was the commander of uh, Apollo 16, the command module pilot of Apollo 16. And here is what uh, he has had to say recently about his uh, mate on this mission, Henry Hartsfield. Hank's one of those people that is, uh, I guess you would describe him as just genuinely honest, candid human being. He's one of the funniest people I've ever known. Uh, you can go through a day and, and he can work hard, but there's always, he can make up a joke or a pun about whatever you're doing that fits in. It doesn't distract from your activities. It just makes, makes what you're doing fun. Well, they should have fun, and uh, Mattingly has, of course, referred to this as the magic machine, this shuttle. And how does uh, Hank Hartsfield feel about Ken Mattingly? Well, we have a report on that, too. Very intense person. Uh, perhaps one of the hardest working individuals I've ever known. Uh, talented. Uh, he knows an awful lot about the orbiter, and uh, he works very hard at it and very capable. Well, as you can see, they are both uh, kind of low-key uh, personalities. But uh, they're all set to go right now, nestled uh, up there in the cockpit of Columbia. The space shuttle that has gone into space three times before has always had uh, flawless takeoffs and flawless landings. The landing will be one week from today, July the 4th, at Edwards Air Force Base in California. We are only seven minutes away now from a sight that always thrills whenever it occurs. It's just never going to become routine. Have a good drink now, young man, because you're going to hear a big roar in about seven minutes. <laughs> There's a white room uh, moving back, uh, I believe, Frank. Uh, we can't see it yet on our monitor, but there it is. It's oh, yes. moving away from the, uh, the hatch area. That's where the, the crew walks uh, from out of the tower and into the uh, hatch of the orbit. It's moving away for clearance. You know, it might be... Uh, well, I remember, as soon as STS-4 gets uh, in space, we'll, uh, I believe, have four Russians, a Frenchman, and, uh, and two Americans up there all at the same time. And I would venture to say the two Americans can uh, carry their share of the weight up there. Yes, their orbital paths are uh, not going to bring them uh, very close to each other, too, I guess. There's a lot of room up there. No, space is pretty big. Here is a uh, satellite, satellite space picture taken at, uh, oh, at 9 o'clock this morning, about an hour and a uh, little more than two hours less than two hours ago and you can see how clear it is over the uh, Cape area. The temperature right now 85 degrees, light scattered clouds, visibility seven miles. Did uh, John Young go up in his weather plane already uh, to verify that everything is okay for a landing at the Cape in case they had to come back? He did uh, Frank but I venture to say he could have done that from the ground. I don't think I've ever seen a more perfect day to do anything uh, certainly to uh, to reach into space this morning. There's a view from the white room as we, uh, as we look down the path that the, uh, the big service structure uh, rolled out uh, many, many weeks ago to bring the shuttle to the pad. That's quite a shot, too. These are some NASA cameras here. Here's the voice of uh, shuttle control. Recorded service information for playback after landing. Coming up on the five-minute point, 12 seconds away. The orbiter flight recorders are on. Frank, these... Five minutes. Coming up on T-minus five. Everything looks good. T-minus five minutes and counting. And we have a goal for APU start. Frank, these pictures that we've been seeing are engineering pictures that are located all around the pad. There's some 50-plus uh, of them uh, for engineering analysis after the launch. Yes, and there are some chase planes, too, that might provide some pictures even as we uh, get away. Hydraulic power to move the aero surfaces and main engines for steering. About to remove the cap off the uh, external tank, too. 30 seconds and counting. The firing circuit for the solid rocket booster ignition and range safety destruct devices have been armed. This is done with a motor-driven switch called a Space 7 they're, arm device. They're in the process of starting the auxiliary minus power minus units, and of course that's a familiar count. term uh, to us because we've had trouble with uh, with those units and before. Yes. Well, we're not very far away. I just want to remind you before we get uh, going here that uh, this week with David Brinkley will immediately follow our broadcast at 11.30 Eastern Time. 
And the uh, topic of discussion will be the changeover in the control at the Department of State, the resignation of Secretary of State Haig and the accession of uh, George Schultz. At which time the solid rocket ignition sequence starts, culminating with ignition and liftoff at T0. Frank, I don't know exactly how many people were here, but uh, I've never seen so many cars on an Essa Causeway. Uh, they were about 12 abreast, stretching for uh, six to eight miles. It was just incredible. Sure, I can understand that, Gene. <laughs> and the young people are just so enthused. Of course, they're out of school, but they've been here for two or three days, and... Uh, and uh, this launch in Disney World, of course, is going to be the high points in their uh, in their lives for a long time. Well, I'll bet there are a lot of repeaters, too. People who have been down there and have seen it once want to come back and see it again. Well, there's a few of us grown-ups here who get a little excited about it, too. T-minus <laughs> three minutes, five seconds, and counting. We can be looking for the big uh, cap on the, uh, on the uh, tank, as we see it there, on the uh, liquid hydrogen and oxygen tank to, be, uh, to move back here shortly.